During uh, Mark's presentation this morning, I, I came to the realization that I have never been associated in any way, shape, or form with a product that was sent to Mars. So I'm feeling a little inadequate and vulnerable right now. Um, but uh, quick history, started out in investment banking, did four years of uh, indentured servitude uh, at J.P. Morgan. Uh, you learn a ton, great first job, terrible last job. Um, moved on to uh, my first startup, uh, which was a Colo, which was an outsourced uh, recruiting uh, startup. We had a combination of services and technology. Uh, then went to what was then Odesk, now Upwork, big freelancer marketplace, started out running operations. Um, I was the, uh, I referred to myself as the executive storm drain. If it didn't fall neatly within one of the other functions, I ended up with it. Uh, so a ton of fun there, had a great run. Uh, then left to be the uh, CEO of Visually, uh, which was a turnaround situation. Um, and so that was a similar model to what we were doing on the enterprise business at, at Odesk, um, where we had a freelancer back end and we were selling uh, creative services to brands and, and agencies. Uh, sold that in 2016, joined Skillshare originally as a COO and then took on the CEO role about a year ago. And along the way, we had a whole mess of kids. Um, so being able to fly to California and get a good night's sleep in a really nice bed is uh, a huge win. I can't tell my wife about any of it. Um, so uh, diving right in, I wanted to go through just some of the stream of consciousness things I've learned over the years. Um, and starting out, there's a very big difference in how people perceive you and, and how they react to what you say. Um, I remember early on and visually, an idea just came out of my mouth and within 15 minutes, somebody was running with it. Uh, and Elena, we worked together at, uh, at Odesk. Um, I had some amazing ideas that I couldn't get anybody to listen to. Uh, so it was a very big turnaround. All of a sudden, I just breathed something, and they think that's, and it, you know, I'll, they need to go do it. Uh, so that was an interesting realization. Um, and also, when you're uh, the head of a 5, 10, 15-person company versus a 75 or 5,000-person company, People respond very differently. The truth-telling component kicks in. They start to lie to you. And I have caught people bullshitting. And I'm like, you, I, that's not, you don't have to do it. I'm, I haven't been a CEO long enough to believe my own bullshit yet. So feel free to just tell me what you think. And uh, when you can find those people who will just say it like it is, it's extraordinarily valuable. Um, the other uh, theme I hear a lot is it's lonely at the top. It's a very lonely job. Um, this has come up in a couple of the earlier conversations. I think if you're lonely at the top, you're not doing it right. Uh, you've got, you should have a great board. You've got a network of advisors, mentors, people you can bounce ideas off of. My executive team, you know, that is my, they're my team. And I don't have to know everything. I shouldn't know everything. I need them to push back. I need to bounce ideas off of. I'm not doing this alone. And if we were, we wouldn't be, if I was doing it alone, we wouldn't be nearly as successful. So I think uh, your job is to surround yourself with the right people so that it is never lonely and you've always got the backup that you need. Um, and then uh, I feel like you stole all my bullets. Um, some great uh, uh, points around just how you hire an executive team. Um, every team that I've had to overhaul, uh, I was looking at, all right, have they been where we're going to be in two years? And you can do great things early on uh, with a company of just taking really smart, young athletes that work 24 seven and promoting them just you keep piling stuff on them and they just keep figuring it out but at some point you need someone around you that knows where you're headed and has that muscle memory and can help you build into where you're going as opposed to trying to figure it out on the fly um, if you are flying a plane and it's your first time in the air it's pretty damn scary so i, I want i want people with hands on the wheel who know the things that i don't um, so this is, uh, I was at an Inc. 500 conference years ago, and there's a guy named Marshall Goldsmith who, uh, he's one of these management gurus, and he gave a talk on adding too much value. And there is a tendency of smart people, particularly managers, execs, CEOs, of the, somebody comes to you with an idea, and it's, hey, that's a great idea, but what if we blank? Well, it just went from being their idea that they're really fired up to go execute on, and now it's your idea that they have to go execute on. And I think the difficult um, thing to be thinking through is when are you actually making the better, making it better enough 
to offset the degradation of execution that you're going to get from it being your idea versus their idea. And when should you just shut up and say, hey, that's awesome, go for it. Look forward to seeing the results and then see what happens. So uh, it's hard to do, but there's times you just got to keep your mouth shut and say, hey, go get them. Um, I hate Glassdoor. Uh, I just absolutely hate it. Um, you know, every now and then you make a bad hire and you're trying to do the right thing, you give them feedback, you give them opportunities to improve, you're giving them some aggressive coaching, at some point you have to set the gun on the table and have the Howard talk. Glassdoor gives them a megaphone to the world. And meanwhile, the 98% of your other employees who are happy, killing it, love working there, buy into what you're trying to do, they're not on Glassdoor because they're doing their goddamn job. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to vent. If you want to talk later, <laughs> Uh, if, you, if you want to talk later, I'll tell you what I really think. Um, all right, so uh, the four companies, uh, four startups I've worked in, I sort of had two of each, right? Uh, uh, Colo and visually, everything was hard. It just, it felt like we were running in sand all the time. And we had great people. We worked our ass off. I think we made all the right decisions. It was just a tough business. And meanwhile, at... Odesk, you know, the joke in 2009, 2010, we're growing at 100% year over year. People would be like, hey, what are you doing? Like, we don't know. Like, we're just staying out of the way and letting it run. Uh, and that was a magical feeling. Um, then I go to visually, turnaround situation. Everything was tough. Everything was hard. We managed to get that thing turned around, sold it. I go to Skillshare, and, you know, we walk in every day, and there are so many cringeworthy things that just make my skin crawl and we're growing at 130% year over year and everything's cranking. So it's just, there are, you know, the simplified version of this is you can't polish a turd. Um, the, you know, there are just certain businesses that have good bones uh, and when you, when you find it, you know it. Um, the reason that visually was a turnaround was because of this. Uh, I think startups, uh, particularly if you get behind on numbers or things start to, you know, turn the wrong direction, you start grabbing for that thing that's going to save you, that one thing that's going to break it all wide open. And you lose focus on just coming in every day and making gradual incremental improvements. Um, and, I think, and we see a lot of this at, at Skillshare as well. We made one little tweak to optimize our checkout page and our conversion went up 10%, like 10%. Uh, you know, and I think the, meanwhile, we had spent six months working on sort of launching this groups, forums, discussions, and it, it's a great sort of Horizon 2, Horizon 3 activity, but we were taking our eye off some of the tech debt that's slowing us down, some of the performance issues that we're dealing with, some of the very simple optimizations that we just haven't touched that can have huge improvements. So um, I think it's easy to get into the strategic thrashing about when you're early, uh, but don't take your eye off the ball of just coming in every day and making things a little better. Uh, so we have a fairly intense annual planning process. Um, and the model that I'm using actually came a lot, uh, came primarily out of uh, some of the things I saw at Odesk and then uh, Elance Odesk. So Odesk acquired Elance and then the Elance CEO became CEO of the joint company. So I got to see two very different CEOs running effectively the same business. Gary, the Odesk CEO was very consensus driven, very bottoms up, everybody got buy-in Management team meetings were WWF, like, you know, everybody got their licks in. It was great, uh, but we had trouble getting everybody to move in the same direction, so we struggled with alignment. Elance was the exact opposite. Fabia was very much top-down. He wanted to, your job as an exec was to give him the information he needed to set the direction for the company. They can both work very well. It's just two very different styles. We always had alignment with Fabio but he always didn't have buy-in from the management team on where we're going and why. So we try to balance these two things out. You get a little bit of bottoms up, generate some ideas, you come with a top-down theme, then you get some bottoms up um, roadmaps from the departments, and then you make sure that they actually align with what you're trying to do. Uh, so this was something that we've figured out over time. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from um, the uh, Ben Horowitz book, um, Hard Thing About Hard Things. Uh, if you have to make layoffs, uh, figure out how many you think you need to make, add 50%, and then do it. Um, I made that mistake at Colo. Uh, we were a recruiting service, 2008 hit. We're selling to venture-backed startups in the Bay Area. 
I was not a dream market to be in at the time. Uh, we had three rounds of layoffs, and that is just catastrophic to the culture. Should have done it once, been done with it, and then God forbid you have to hire people back, amen. Um, tech debt, had visually. Um, we had a three-year backlog of bugs. The company was only two years old. Um, <laughs> stuff just didn't work. And so we keep piling new features and functionality on top of it. And it's like, guys, so we just stopped, took two months. We did nothing but get the platform stable. And it was excruciating. But there was a window as the new CEO when I could make that kind of call. I wasn't going to be able to do that in eight months. So we did it. We didn't nibble. And we got through it. Um, if you got bad news for the board, I think the, the conversation around managing your board was a great one. Um, if you've got a really bad, got bad news to deliver, look around for any other bad news that you can lump in with it and get it all done at once. Because there's a steady stream of bad news is not how CEOs stay employed. Um, you can't over communicate. Uh, so you have the town hall meeting and you discuss whatever. Then you send out the email and then you write the blog post and then you have another town hall meeting. And then you get feedback, and then you send out an updated blog post. And then you sit down with someone the next day for lunch, and you say, hey, what do you think? And it's like the, none of it ever happened. So if people aren't actively making fun of you behind your back, you haven't said it enough. Um, culture becomes what you tolerate, not what you put on the website. Uh, we, had, uh, some, we had a pocket of engineers at one of my companies that um, were culturally cancerous. They were really hard to work with. Uh, they were just difficult across the company, uh, and they had there was a ringleader. And I had a couple conversations with this engineer um, and sort of made it clear what was going to be okay and what wasn't. Um, she stuck around for probably four months and then ended up leaving. Um, I still, to this day, kick myself for not saying, hey, appreciate all your work. This place is not for you. I'm going to take care of you. Here's a nice check. Off you go. Um, because she left on her terms. And it sent the message to everybody else that it was OK. She got to leave on her own terms. She got to act however she wanted. Um, and then I had to go clean that up with the 10 people that she left behind. Uh, so when you see behaviors, and this is particularly important as you're growing, it's a lot harder at 75 to fix than at 15. When you make those hiring mistakes or when you see someone who's just not quite aligned with how you want the company uh, to be run, make the hard decision. Make it quickly. Be fair to them. Be magnanimous when you send them off, uh, but send them off. Um, we, uh, my first startup, the CEO was a um, Notre Dame rower, and he like borderline Olympic team. Um, he had us go do this leadership training uh, where it was a combination of rowing and sort of workshopping in a classroom. The uh, one of the exercises, so they had four of us in a boat. So it's the CEO, who's Olympic caliber rower, me, who might as well be. Uh, <laughs> and then we had two, uh, these two, um, I'll describe them as HR weenies, uh, who were not very athletic. Uh, and they had us doing uh, sort of time trials where we would rotate, just two of us would keep our oars in the water, and the other two would row. So two would be stabilizing the boat while the other two rowed. The fastest time we had, or when John and I were keeping the boat steady and the other two were rowing. And, you know, obvious management lesson, I think there's, back to the adding too much value, there's an urge to grab the oar and just start rowing like crazy, particularly when things aren't going well. And what I have found is there are times when the best thing you can do for the company is just keep your oars in the water, keep the boat steady, let everybody else pull, because you're going to end up making things a lot worse if you just get in there and start thrashing around. Um, so that's really it. I mean, I think the other thing for me, um, going from you know being part of a very successful company as a VP or um, as a non-CEO uh, has been very different. Uh, the highs are higher, the lows are lower, uh, but when it's working and everything's clicking, uh, there are a few things better. So thank you. Any questions? At a certain point, like hiring the people who have done this before, right? Have, have scaled a company, been 50 to 150, I guess like, or beyond that. I wonder a little bit about the implications for just like pipeline of leadership, yeah. right? Like if the idea is always that the people who may have been very diverse or come from a lot of backgrounds or not worked in tech got you to 50, 
but then you're saying, I got to go find the person who looks like the VP of every other company and bring them in. Yeah. Like at what point do you decide someone who's 70 or 80% there, you know, that last 20% you invest versus only look for the people who've done it before? Yeah. Like, and how does that recalcify issues? Yeah, I, I guess the, there's a balancing act. Um, I mean, I think the, when I look at our management team, we've got one who had not been there before. So he, he went from a director role into a VP role and he's killing it. Um, if I had an entire team that looked like him, that would not be good. Um, but having you know a mix where you've got some up-and-comers along with some people who have been there, done that, I actually think that's the right balance. Because um, you also don't want to send the message that you will never grow here, there's a ceiling. So if you haven't done it before, you got to go somewhere else to get experience. Um, it's a tough balance to, to find, but I just if you walk into the exec room uh, and you're the most experienced person, like I never want to be the smartest guy in the room. Um, I, I want to be the dumbest guy in the room. Uh, maybe easier for me than some of you, but uh, I just I think there's uh, comfort in having that expertise around you. Could you talk a little bit more about you mentioned you know the the balancing between you know, the top down and the consensus driven um, kind of decision making processes? C can you talk a little bit more about how you effectively did balance those out? Yeah, I, I think you know company wide. Um, I make the joke that we are not a democracy, we are a benevolent dictatorship. Um, so, you know, ultimately somebody's got to make the call. And that's not just company-wide, it's departmental. It's, you know, all, it should work its way all the, all the way down. Um, so I think it depends on, uh, I don't know if you've read uh, First 90 Days, uh, but there are some, I think, some lessons in that book that apply to day-to-day -day management and sort of how you drive consensus versus making a call. If it's a fire, if the house is on fire, you don't have time to circulate a, for a, a Google form to get everybody's feedback. Like you just, you start moving. Um, if it's something that's longer term, it's a bigger change, you've got time to make, figure it out, you've got time to build consensus, you have the conversations, you do the skip levels. Like if you have time to drive consensus and then make a call, um, that's, that's ideal. Um, but a lot of times you just don't have time or it's a very contentious decision and it's 50-50. And, um, you know, I look at Odesk, I think some of our biggest mistakes were because we didn't make a decision. It just, we just kept, kept fighting. Um, and at some point you just got to step in and make the call because if you let it go too far, you end up with, uh, you know, interpersonal dynamics get harmed in a way that's really hard to fix. So I would love to hear your vision because I think with um, Open Table and yours, you know, some of the things we're all working on, not the sexiest thing, um, but for example, Airbnb working there sounds incredible, right? But ultimately, you're, you're just like day to day, you're just probably matching people to where they live. Yeah. I'm sure it's far more exciting than that. Um, but I just love to see it. Like, what is the vision that yeah. you're telling your company, you know, and the same with Open Table? Like, what is it? Like, yeah. I just. Like yeah, so, so Skillshare, we are a, a online learning community for creators. Um, and, and the for creators part is something we've sort of recently focused on. We've always had a strength in creatives, designers, illustrators, photographers. That's always been kind of our bread and butter. Um, two years ago when I started, I was actually pushing for us to expand into business and technology. And, um, and we've sort of come to the realization, like, when it, you know, again, when, it's, when is it hard and when is it easy? Like, when we're working with that creative community and, and that 28-year-old freelance designer, like we can add a ton of value. They love Skillshare. They get a ton out of it. Like that, those are the stories we get back where I was able to you know, break out of my freelance career. I got the promotion or I've just found, I've rediscovered something I love doing personally. Um, and so when we think about our vision and our mission, if we can take all of the expertise in the world and pull it together so that you can learn from anyone, you can teach anyone. Our number one source of teachers is our students. So like every, everyone has something to contribute. So if our job and our platform facilitates that connection um, and really gives people access to learning that they just would never have access to otherwise, um, it's a pretty powerful motivator for us. And, uh, and having a strong mission and vision you know, if you're trying to recruit in New York City or San Francisco, like you can't outspend Google and Facebook. So there's got to be some other draw. And I think for us, having people who 
wake up every morning fired up to go help those people learn, that's what that's what keeps our retention high. I think we have to stop there, unfortunately. Uh, we'll keep the program moving, but thank you, Matt. Happy to talk more. Thank you.